Hello, everyone. My name is Mark Kageyama, and I'd like to welcome everyone here to, to be your own hero. I'm a stage four prostate, bone, and lung cancer patient slash survivor. Been dealing with cancer since uh, late 2020, didn't diagnose in early 2021. Been doing very, very well. In fact, I just uh, talked to my new oncologist office today and uh, finally reestablished uh, my connection with an, oncolog an oncologist here in Texas. It's just taken so long. Uh, I first they made me uh, uh, get a primary, which I did, and then I finally got referred to an oncologist. This whole process has taken like three months, which to me is kind of crazy the the way they slow walked everything. But uh, it is what it is. You know, when you go to a new place, you know they don't like uh, seeing. <laughs> the information from another state for whatever reason. And so it, it took longer than I thought, but we're all good. And I got my first appointment in a couple of weeks, basically to just check and see where I am. I feel absolutely fantastic. So uh, real happy about that. And I'm also very, very happy to welcome back our guest, Judith Ann Desjardins, and she's from the wonderful state of California, uh, real close. In fact, she was she lives in the in the uh, city that I was born in. So, you know, we have that in common. But uh, at this time, Judith, please reintroduce yourself, and everybody is in for a treat because we've got some great subjects to discuss, Judith. Okay, to catch everybody up to speed in terms of if you didn't see part one, and this is your first view of me on part two, I'll just summarize that I was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in on October 7th, 2020. I had had some... Uh, like six identifying symptoms prior. And um, they were, um, I had reflux. I had a strange taste in my mouth. I lost 10 pounds without effort. Um, I had severe bloating, abdominal bloating. And my muscles had begun wasting in terms of having uh, loose loose skin under my uh, arms, on my thighs, and my stomach. And that was very, all of that, those symptoms were totally foreign to me and not like my very fit, active body. So I ended up going to two internists who couldn't find any problem. When they did physical exam, nothing showed up, nothing showed up in the blood work. Uh, the second internist said, at least I'm going to refer you to a gastroenterologist. And when I went to her, she did the same physical exams and she did uh, blood testing couldn't find anything, but said, I'm going to pay attention to your symptoms, unlike the other two people who saw you. And she ordered um, endoscopy with ultrasound. And um, I think prior to the, no, that was first. And then I had a CT exam and it was 99% sure I had pancreatic cancer. I had my surgery October 23rd, 2020. Wow, that was fast. So three yes. days after you got your original diagnosis? Yes, in this particular wow. in this particular instance, UCLA was really on top of it. Once I saw the inter the uh, specialist who did the uh, endoscopy with ultrasound, he speed tracked me to the surgeon at UCLA that I eventually uh, 
chose, but I also went um, for other consultations elsewhere and was convinced that UCLA was the place for me. So at the time I was diagnosed with stage one pancreatic cancer in the tail of my pancreas, a little tiny tumor. And um, at the time, the surgeon said we had wide margins. We double checked. We got it all. The cancer shouldn't come back. But the tumor board said in this case, because uh, pancreatic cancer is such a um, deadly form of cancer, we think you should have the insurance of going for chemo. So then I went, started, um, they wanted me to start chemotherapy three weeks after my major abdominal surgery. And I said, no, I'm giving myself, I think I said, I'm giving myself two months. Normally they would give you three weeks. And I said, I want to uh, continue my anti-cancer diet. I want to exercise. I want my body to be ready to deal with the chemotherapy. So then I started January of 2021. I started five months of chemotherapy, GEMSAR. And when I finished- Let me pause you right there. Okay. Um, so this is for our audience. Why is pancreatic cancer so deadly? Because you hear that all the time. But what are the reasons? Can you share well, that? Um, the fact that it kills, is that first of all, very few people are diagnosed at stage one. Most people don't notice their body. They may not be in touch with their body, but I've been a holistic psychotherapist and uh, very in tune with body, mind, emotion, and spirit. So I noticed it where most people don't get diagnosed until they're stage four. And because it's a, such a deadly disease, once they're diagnosed at stage four, they generally die within three months. Mm -hmm. So it it is one of the deadliest forms of cancer. Unlike some others that are slow growing, this is very aggressive and uh, has so far outwitted the medical community. So I did five months of the single um, chemo called GEMSAR. And at the end of five months, I had developed uh, blood clots in both lower lungs. And so they said, you know, we think you've had enough. And the can the oncologist said that cancer is gone. It's never coming back. So for 30 months, there was no detectable cancer. And then, and I was treated on Eliquis for my blood clots for a year. But the saying that it's gone, it's never coming back is not really true because once cancer is in your body, there will be microscopic cells going around that are undetectable. And at 30 months, when I was getting a pulmonary CT, they incidentally found a very small tumor in the upper left quadrant of my liver. So in this case, my CA199, which is our cancer marker for pancreas cancer, during chemo, it was at 24. When they found it in the liver, it was at 500. I was stuck in a limbo for a whole month while the tumor board was trying to decide what should we do with her. A, she's unusual because, well, I am unusual, but they didn't know how unusual. 
she's <laughs> unusual because she's stage one. Yeah, stage one. And this is just a small tumor in the liver. So the tumor board hemmed and hawed for three, almost four weeks. And they said, you could do chemo, you could do surgery, there's radiation. And finally, this interventional radiologist raised his hand and he said, I think I have something to offer. It's called an ablation. So by the time I had settled on, I want the ablation, my cancer marker CA199 was up to 2,202. They wasted a full month and I had gone to other places to interview their uh, pancreatic program and settled on uh, the less invasive. So that was in June of last year, one year ago, 2023. And now I am one year post ablation but I'm being followed every two to three months um, by uh, MRIs and CT scans. And recently my numbers have started to climb again, even though the last two sets of MRIs and CTs have been negative for tumors. So that is, that is kind of a frightening situation and they're saying we can't treat it because there's nothing visible to treat. And inwardly, you're wondering what's going to happen. And I ended up falling into a fear spiral because two young people in my life, my nephew at 56 died of melanoma, and my best friend in the pancreatic community, girl I loved like a daughter, died at 46. Too young. Too young, same oncologist, same regimes, but she died. And I'm thinking, so am I, am I going to die? And I saw them on the deathbed, which visually is very frightening for a cancer patient when you... It's one thing when I was an oncology social worker in the 70s, I sat on many deathbeds and ushered the patient into the next life, literally, as I was there. They were halfway here and halfway seeing people and preparing for the journey. But when you've got that same diagnosis, you're treated by the same oncologist, and you see a person wasted from cancer. It's, it's like a shocking visual. And that rolled me into a fear spiral that was worse than any experience I had um, during the prior four, nearly four years. As a holistic psychotherapist, I treat people with fear. I have treated cancer patients about fear, but when you are the patient, it's your body and your marker numbers are going up and you have these visuals of death. I tried every possible intervention in my toolkit in terms of prayer, meditation, journaling, art therapy, uh, talking about it, running, my anti-cancer diet, all of that. But until I literally broke down before my last MRI, and while I'm waiting to go into it, I'm writing on my phone in my notes, a letter to God, and I said, 
I'm at the I'm at the end of my wits here. I am trying everything humanly possible to live. Something is going on and I'm frightened. I'm frightened and I'm all by myself going in for this MRI. Please help me. And I must say that in the whole process of meeting the nurse who put the contrast uh, IV catheter in my arm, her name was Angelica. And I thought huh. she is an angel. The, the Fernando, uh, who was the tech, came in and I said, I only have two requests. Please tell me when to breathe and when I can start breathing again. I went into that MRI and I had a personal experience with God in the MRI, unlike any, and I've had too, too many to count, where I could feel the physical presence of God saying, you're okay, I'm in the capsule with you. The whole, the sounds became soothing sounds when the MRI is beep, 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 beep loud sounds at the end. I felt like I was in a rainforest. Mm. I felt it was the bamboo and then water just rushing over me. I was in such a deep state of peace that when I was finished and Fernando said, your breathing was very good and whatever, I said, it was the most wonderful MRI I have ever had. It was fantastic. God was in there with me. I, so that's let me how pause I you. Wrote... Let me pause you right there. I, I was going to mention it earlier, but when you had those two people in your life pass away, I, I think that's a thing that really uh, affects your soul. It really, especially if you're going through treatments and things like that, uh, that that leaves a lasting effect on you. I mean, I had two people that I was close to pass before I got cancer, but that left such an impression on me that uh, you just don't forget that. And uh, wow. the body has a sense memory. What you see goes into the cells of your body and you carry that in the grieving process for the person who passed, but also the fear of this could be me is in there. That shock and fear and dread and anxiety is in you. And it's, it's very hard to release it. And if you don't release it, as a, a psychotherapist, I can tell you that it sets off a fight, flight, immobilization response where your pupils dilate, your heart beats fast, um, blood is trying to get through very narrow uh, vessels to go to your hands and feet so you can run or fight. The worst thing in which I was, was immobilized. Stress cortisol and adrenaline are released, so you are hyped up which is supposed to be a temporary response to a dangerous situation. But when you're in a fear loop, it goes on and on and on. And physiologically, stress causes inflammation, causes a strain on your immune system, and you are more prone to have a recurrence if that goes on. So it, it can be devastating. Right. Absolutely. I, I mean, I think, it, go. please go on with your story because this is fascinating as far okay. as uh, uh, where I, we're going. I was hoping that the ablation was the last thing to happen. But I think consequently to holding all that stress and grief 
and fear for four months, my remaining 60% of my pancreas, when I had the, the surgery, they removed 40% of my cancer, my pro, uh, pancreas, all of my spleen, eight lymph nodes. So prior to this, my 60% was pumping enough digestive enzymes and insulin to help me digest food. But when my body was under that stress and my immune system wasn't working as well, I started developing the very same symptoms that I originally had when I was first diagnosed with cancer, which scared the hell out of me. I don't blame you. I lost four pounds, which on my small frame was significant. I had this severe abdominal uh, bloating from under my rib cage all the way down to the lowest parts of the abdomen. I was having trouble um, with elimination and I started getting the loose skin and I totally freaked out. And I reached out to my surgeon because my oncologist wasn't paying attention to it. I reached out to my surgeon on a Saturday, I sent him an email. I said, I'm having the following symptoms. Something's wrong. It's probably my pancreas. They haven't found anything in scans, but I'm gonna be going for a PET CT. I have two questions for you. Would you do the surgery? I trust you and you know my body. Two, how fast can you do it? Because I don't want to get stuck in that limbo again of nobody can make a decision. Mm -hmm. And he said, have you ever thought of pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy? And I said, no, nobody in four years has ever talked to me about that. So I went back to my oncologist and said, I want to start pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy. And, and he said, well, you could do that, but if you only have bloating, this kind of bloating one week out of three in a month, that's not so bad. And I jumped up and I said, this is my body. And it's absolutely unacceptable. It's totally painful. And I want those pills. And I said, I also want a referral to the uh, pancreas specific um, dietitian nutritionist. And again, it was like, well, you don't. And I said, I want it. And I want it soon. And you're bringing up a great point right here is it's not your doctor's life. It's your life. And, and the more that you show that you're fighting for your life, then they're more willing to comply. Otherwise you, they want you to fall in line, you know, act like your number and, and do what you're told. And, and that's no, beautiful. They, that's they, they know in the UCLA, system. I am very assertive. That's awesome. Um, when I was visiting my my dear friend who was in the process of dying and she said, you know, what do you do when the doctor doesn't come and visit you at the hospital? I said, I bug the shit out of them. I keep calling until they have to do something. Now, they're not your friend. God and I are the head of my treatment team. And each of these specialists are on my team. But God and I make the decisions, not you guys. And they're painfully aware of this. 
<laughs> that is fantastic. I love that. If, if, if people out there watching this learn one thing, what Judith just said is just phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. Uh, you are in charge of your direction. You advocate for yourself. You fight for yourself. You show that your life means everything to you. And once you show them that, that your doctors, then that gives them a different impression. That gives them a different outlook on you. And uh, it, it, it's and a beautiful thing. And sometimes it's not a good outlook. Sometimes <laughs> it's like, here comes that pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> but I love and, it. And and if you have that attitude and you still do not get what you need, you change doctors. Right. There you go. A absolutely incredible. And that that is and, and no matter what you are dealing with health-wise, uh that's the attitude that you've got to take. It's your health it's your life and you're the one who's the boss not your doctor as much as they want to take control and they want to be in charge uh you know and, and the sooner a person do, does that the sooner the person puts their foot down and said hey say hey i am a person and you're going to treat me like a person not like somebody who's just falling in line that is awesome. And, and if people can learn that, then they're going to generally end up with a better, better way of treatment. Well, I, I knew that as an oncology social worker, I would teach patients how to get their doctor or deal with the doctor. If he walked, he generally, he walked into the room. Often they would breeze in and breeze out. And, and we would actually joke and say, uh, was that a shadow? Did I, whatever. So I would teach patients to have the doctor sit down, have questions ready to ask them. Or as the social worker, I would write in the notes, this patient is feeling such and such, please address these issues. But these days there's no oncology social workers in the systems. They've oh. gotten phased out because it's too expensive. Mm. So when my husband was diagnosed with prostate cancer in 2011, I was ready to jump on it and be his oncology social worker going through the process. So we, I knew what to do. I knew the terminology. I knew the different specialties. I knew how to get attention and whatever. And he was able to just show up as the patient because I was very proactive for asking questions, sometimes questions he didn't want even me to ask, I asked them anyway, because <laughs> he was under my care. <laughs> and, actually, and actually, this one time after he had his initial surgery, and there was some leftover uh, prostate um, cancer, he was still making uh, high uh, PSA. We went back for one final visit with the oncologist and we went into the small office and there was a, a an exam uh, table right between us. And I said, could you sit down and talk with us? And he said, no, I won't. Wow. And I said, wasn't it good that the Gleason score from the uh, surgical pathology was lower than what you had thought initially? And he he went off in a tyrant in terms of, 
you prostate cancer patients are always looking for the silver lining and this and that. And don't you understand if there's a five number in there, that's what kills you? And he walked out. That was it. So sometimes being assertive will actually drive the doctor out of the room. Then you got to find another doctor. Well, we moved into radiation and had better luck. Okay. And we really lucked out when we got a wonderful oncologist who we loved, who all the patients loved at City of Hope. Oh, fantastic. He was just superb and sat and his nurse practitioner sat with us and he attended the uh, stage four group. And he is, he signed an endorsement on the back of my book. I'll actually read what he wrote because it's pretty neat. What is unique about this book are the very specific recommendations on coping with cancer diagnosis directed to patients, spouses, and healthcare providers. The book is very honest, talks about the ups and downs, setbacks, fears, frustrations, but ultimately coping, faith, and hope. I recommend this book to cancer patients, their spouses and significant others, doctors and nurses involved in the care of cancer patients, social workers, and other health care providers. And his name is Premisla Twardowski, medical oncologist at City of Hope. That A is great guy. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Judith, we gotta we have to wrap up here. Uh we <laughs> do have more to discuss, so we'll figure out what we're gonna do as our next steps. <laughs> but I have one final question for you. Yep. What do you do on a daily basis to Brighten up someone else's day. Mm. Um, in my, well, within my family and friend network, I send texts to people. Um, I have a big prayer list for all the people that I'm praying for every night. I hold my cat, Hope. And we're at this quasi altar and I have a long list of people that I pray for. So, and they know I'm praying for them and I pray for some people that don't even know that I'm praying for them. Um, in my yard, I have a profoundly beautiful, exquisite garden. I have a a uh, little free library. I have um, benches that are along the property line. I have water bowls for the neighbor dogs. I told you I love dogs. And um, I talk easily to people and I smile and there's no end to people that I meet that just come up for a hug. That is awesome. I love that. <laughs> Absolutely love that. <laughs> Judith, thank you so much for your time. It's been just absolutely beautiful. I, I, I loved it. And uh, we're also going to share uh, in the description, and I'm also going to put in the comment section, uh, your website and information, how people can find out more about you. And I suggest you do that because Judith has so much to share and so much uh, knowledge about, uh, about health and all cancer. And she's also an author as she showed you. So thank you from the bottom of my heart, Judith. It's, it's been a pleasure. You know that I love working with you and this isn't the last. <laughs> no, it isn't. <laughs> we're going to have, I think we're going to keep having more and more chapters and just to say that we're getting a marvelous turnout and reaction to the first one. 
And I'm so delighted to feature Mark as a special guest on my www holistic cancer recovery hub.com. He's got three different interviews in there, and this will be the fourth that we're posting. Oh, beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you, Judith. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And One I'd more like... thing. Wow. I'm that going is, to share this. That is beautiful. Wow. That, that was made by my friend, Amy. Um, these are roses from her garden that remind her of her mother who died of pancreatic cancer. And so I want to share them with you for that happy is, Father's Day. Thank you. That is absolutely beautiful. Um, yeah, I'll tell so you more she about has my... been, Her mother has been here joining our session. We were three cancer patients together today. Wow, that that is spectacular. Absolutely spectacular. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you once again, Judith. And thank you, everyone, for joining us here at To Be Your Own Hero. And I hope everyone has a chance to uh, enjoy the week. Have a great weekend. And thank you for uh, subscribing to the channel if you can. Make a comment and uh like, like the video, and we'll see you next week on To Be Your Own Hero. Thank you very much.